verse says, everything that has a breath, praise the Lord. Are we breathing this morning, church? Yes, we get to praise God. So everybody stand up. We're going to sing this song called Praise. We've done it in student ministry. We're going to do it here this morning. Maybe you guys have heard it. Sing it along. I'll praise in the valley, praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm sure, praise when I'm down. I'll praise when outnumbered, praise when surrounded. Praise is the water, my enemies drown. As I'm breathing, I've got a reason to praise the Lord. Oh, my soul. It's okay to move this morning. Come on. Praise the Lord. Oh, my soul. I'll praise when I feel it. I'll praise when I don't. I'll praise because I know you're still in control. Our praise wears a weapon, it's more than a sound. My praise is a shout that brings Jericho down. As long as I'm breathing, as long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to pray. we praise. God is working behind the scenes all the time. I'll praise cause you're sovereign. Praise cause you reign. Praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. I'll praise cause you're faithful. Praise cause you're true. Praise cause there's nobody greater than you. Praise cause you're sovereign. Praise cause you reign, I'll praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. I'll praise cause you saw, praise cause you're true, praise cause there's nobody greater than you. Come on, praise the Lord, oh my soul. next song talks about our belief in God, uh, all the things he's done for us behind the scenes, right? So we've seen him move, we've seen him move, and he's going to continue to move. There we go. And I live stories that have proved your faithfulness. I've seen miracles my mind can't comprehend. And there is beauty in what I can't understand Jesus it's you Jesus it's you 
believe. This morning, a wonder working God as you are here because you love all the miracles we we'll see. Too good to not believe. Too good to not believe. Too good to not believe. And I can't resurrect. church. He's still at work. We've seen cancer disappear. We've seen broken bodies healed. Don't you tell me he can't do it. Don't you tell me he can't do it. We've seen real life resurrection. We've seen mental health restored. Don't you tell me We've seen families reunited, we've seen prodigals return, and don't you tell me can't do it, don't you tell me can't do it, we've seen troubles foes delivered, we've seen addicts finally free, don't you tell me can't do it, don't you tell me can't do it, we've seen cities sing another song called Run to the Father. Um, it's amazing that God pursues us even when we're unpursuable sometimes. And so our response to worship is we get to run to the Father. Let's sing this.
I shared last Sunday that God tests us through trials. When we go through difficult seasons of life, when we go through difficult challenges, God can use those challenges to put us in His refiner's fire. Even what the enemy intended for evil, God can intend for good. And we believe that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who've been called according to His purpose. And so when we're in the refiner's fire and we persevere through suffering, God can use it to shape our character and to make us into the men and women of God that He's called us to be. Several years ago, uh, I went through a very painful experience and I didn't understand why God was allowing it to happen. In my entire adult life, I have served God. I said anywhere, anytime, anything. And so because I was going through this difficult time, I was disappointed, I was discouraged, I was upset. It was painful for my life, it was painful for my family, it was painful uh, for our church. And I, I really questioned, like, why is God putting me uh, through this? And I was discouraged and I thought about giving up. I thought about leaving the ministry. I thought about going ahead and moving to the beach and, and changing careers. And it was, a, it was a really difficult time for me. Uh, I lost my passion. I lost my confidence. 
I would get up to preach on Sundays and I didn't really want to preach. Like I, I didn't want to get up in front of the church. And I really questioned God's call in my life. Like, God, is this something you've really called me to do? Is this what you've gifted me uh, to do? And uh, and I, I endured. I endured through the suffering. I persevered. I, I kept the faith. And God used it. God, God really showed me some things in my life, and He used it to uh, refine my character. He used it to uh, solidify His call on my life. And I, and I feel like because I went through that pain and I went through that suffering, I'm a better person because of it. I'm a better pastor because of it. And I think our church is better. I think our church is, is more glorifying to God. And it caused me to really evaluate my ministry. So at Greystone, we've all, always been focused on evangelism. And we've seen a couple thousand people commit their lives to Christ and get baptized. But we always haven't been good at discipleship. And th through this process really caused me to evaluate, like, we want to be passionate about discipleship. We not only want to just see people come to know Christ and be baptized, but we want them to grow to spiritual maturity. We want to see them walk with God for a lifetime. And so through, as a result of me going through this refiner's fire, I led our church to be more focused on discipleship. And I wrote the four discipleship books, and, and we really focused a lot of our time and attention on not just evangelism, but also discipleship and helping people grow to spiritual maturity. And so going through this refiner's fire for me a few years ago, uh, it was good for me, it's good for my family, it was good uh, for our church. I know that many of you are in the refiner's fire right now. You're, you're going through a difficult situation. And last Sunday when I shared that every single one of us ha has a thorn in our flesh, I know that resonated with you uh, because I could sense the Holy Spirit uh, speaking through me. And many of you wrote on your cards uh, that thorn in the flesh, or you wrote the, the difficult challenge that you're going through, or you wrote a sin that you're wanting to repent of, or you wrote a character weakness, or, or some of you, you just, you just wrote prayers to God. You just, you just words your heart out to God. And so as, as I'm burning these cards today, and we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cards uh, from, all, from all the campuses, as we are going through the refiner's fire, hopefully God is drawing us closer to himself, making us more like Jesus, and we're becoming the men and women of faith that God has called us to be. So if you have a copy of the Bible, we're going to be in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2 today. I want to talk today about a person uh, that God uses, a person that God uses. We're in 2 Timothy chapter 2, I'm going to read verse 15 and following. It says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Avoid godless chatter uh, because because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have departed from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place, and they destroy the faith of some. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription, The Lord knows those who are His, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord will turn away from wickedness. If you're taking points, uh, taking notes, point number one is a person God uses correctly handles the word of truth. The person that God uses correctly handles the word of truth. It says in verse 15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. A person God uses is someone who is building his or her life on the truth of God's Word. You are someone who believes the Bible to be true, and you're standing firm on the truth of God's Word. Now, if you've heard me preach over the last several months, you'll know that this has been a common theme uh, in my messages. And the reason I keep preaching on it is because it's vitally important. And if something is vitally important, we want to keep repeating it over and over again. There is an attack right now on the Word of God, okay? There are many churches and many prominent pastors who are caving into this attack and are watering down the truth of God's Word, 
or they have chosen to be silent on some controversial issues, okay? God hasn't called me to be silent. God has told me to be bold. God has called me to preach the truth, and I want to preach it with clarity and with boldness, okay? I believe this to be the Word of God. The Bible is the inspired, infallible Word of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I believe that all of Scripture is God-breathed. All of the Bible is the Word of God. I believe it all to be true. As my college friend used to say, from the table of contents in the front to the maps in the back, right? From Genesis to Revelation, it is the infallible, inspired Word of God. And one day, I'm going to sit on the judgment seat of Christ, and I'm going to be held accountable for my preaching and my teaching. And I want to be a workman approved by God. I want to be a servant who has correctly handled the Word of God. 1 Timothy 4.16 says to watch your life and doctrine closely. Your life, how you live your life, but also your doctrine, what you believe, what you teach, what your convictions are. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. I want to be saved and I want all of you guys to be saved. We are to persevere in biblical truth. And so even if the majority of the world, and even if the majority of those people in our culture, if they think we're radical, lunatic, Bible thumpers, then so be it. Okay? We are crazy. We, we are Jesus freaks. Okay? And we believe the Bible to be true. James 3.1 says, not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. I'm going to be judged more strictly than you because God has called me to be a teacher and preacher of his word. Now, over the years, I've received a lot of criticism. And one of the, it's crazy that I've received criticism for this, but I've received criticism because I have strong convictions not to drink alcohol. And I believe that pastors and elders are held at a higher standard. It says in 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 and 2, this is a trustworthy saying. If someone aspires to be a church leader, he desires an honorable position. So a church leader must be a man whose life is above reproach. A church leader is to strive to live a life that is above reproach. Now, I'm not, I'm not perfect. I, I tell you guys all the time, I sin, I stumble, I, I fall short. I make mistakes, but I am striving my best to live a life above reproach. I want to live a life that's worthy of God's call on my life. And I believe a huge part of that is being faithful to teach you the truth of God's Word. Now, we want to speak the truth in love. Like We want to love everybody. We want to extend God's grace to everyone. But at the same time, we have to preach the truth of God's Word. And I believe if we're not willing to share the truth with people, then we don't truly love them. Because if we truly love them, we will speak the truth to them. God's Word is clear. And I feel led this week to double down on some of these controversial issues. And that the, the Bible is very clear on this. Because I feel like if we're not constantly teaching it, how, how are our kids going to know if, if the church is not preaching the truth? God's Word is clear. There are only two genders, male and female. We are not assigned a gender at birth, nor do we get to choose our gender, nor is our gender fluid. Okay, our gender is determined by God at conception. We believe that every child in the womb is a child. We believe in the sanctity of life. Marriage is a covenant relationship with God between one man and one woman for life. Homosexuality is a sin. Sex outside of the marriage covenant is a sin. Adultery is a sin. Premarital sex is a sin. Extramarital sex is a sin. Pornography is a sin. Living with someone that you're not married to is a sin. And I don't say all this to, to beat, beat, beat you over the head with the Bible, 
But I want to speak the truth, and I'm going to do it in a loving way. I'm a sinner. I have fallen short. I make mistakes. But God's grace is sufficient for me. You are sinners. You have fallen short. But God's grace is sufficient for you. The reason that Jesus Christ came and died on the cross is to save us from our sins. We are sinners in need of a Savior, and Jesus Christ is our Savior. This is the gospel. This is the good news. God loves sinners. Jesus Christ is a friend of sinners. God wants everyone to come to repentance and come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. The good news is available to everyone. God's good news is available to everyone. Look, look at 1 Corinthians 6. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that's what some of you were. But you were, listen to this, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the gospel. This is the good news. We are all sinners in need of a Savior. So whatever your sin is, you might be, whether you're a homosexual or you're a gossip, whether you drink too much or you eat too much, whether you're a thief or you're just selfish and greedy with your money, God's grace is sufficient for you. If you put your faith in Jesus, he can wash you as white as snow. He'll forgive you of your sins. He'll put a new robe on you, and he'll put a ring on your finger, and he'll put sandals on your feet, and he will bring you into his family and give you eternal life. The gospel is available to everyone. But if we don't preach the truth and we don't speak the truth, how are, how are they going to know that they need Jesus and they need a Savior? So we need to preach the truth. We need to preach the Word of God with love. We, we cannot water down the gospel. Because once you begin to blur the lines and once you begin to water things down, that, that is the beginning of the end. So I want to share with you guys a story about a pastor friend of mine. Or Je Jesse would say more of an acquaintance. Not, not really a friend, right? An acquaintance, a pastor acquaintance. And so several years ago, I was asked to uh, go out to Saddleback, Rick Warren's church, and they were putting together the church planning curriculum for the, to train their church planners. And so, so they brought in some experienced church planners from around the country. I was honored to be a part of, part of this group. Uh, there were eight to 10 of us uh, from around the United States. And there was this one guy there from Seattle, Washington. Never heard of this guy, never heard of his church. But he was telling me about his church. He said, he's talking about how there were 7,000 people. They were a church plant beginning elementary school, and, and they'd grown to 7,000 people. They had, they had multiple campuses, multiple, uh, you know, like 100 staff people, had like $4 million in the bank. Uh, a lot of the Seattle Seahawks went, went to his church, Matt Hasselback, the quarterback for, uh, not, uh, yeah, Seattle Seahawks. Um, so he was telling me all this. So, so I became intrigued about, about this guy's church. And so Jennifer and I were like, hey, let's, let's go out to Seattle. Let's visit them. Let, let's, see, let's see the church. So we flew out to Seattle, and uh, we visited his church. We, we visited uh, Mark Driscoll's church, Mars Hill Church, which doesn't exist anymore. That, that's a whole other story. We visited Judah Smith's church. And so we went to this guy's church. And it was, as he said, like thousands and thousands and thousands of people and uh, they had many, many campuses, many staff, and we, we got tours. And, and so we started, you know, we filled out the uh, communication card like some of you have done. You know, you fill out the card and you start getting the emails and information about the church. And so over the years, we, we started following this church and keep, keeping up with them and, and what they were doing. And they had a situation that, that came out that their, one of their uh, female uh, worship pastors... Uh, turned out to be lesbian. So it's kind of interesting, well, what, what's the pastor going to do about this? What's, what's, the, what's the church going to do about this situation? So the pastor, he's a really smart guy, really brilliant guy. He ends up reading about 70 or 80, you know, books on the subject, does all this research, does all, the, all this study on the subject. 
And he decides to, to lead the church to be uh, a gay-affirming church, an LBGTQ-affirming church. Instead of believing the truth of God's Word and living under the authority of God's Word, he did all this research and all this study, and so he determined what truth was. And this was the beginning of the end for this church. And we saw the whole thing unfold from a distance. It was, it was kind of like uh, the movie Spinal Tap. I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with Spinal Tap. It was a movie when I was in high school. I'm not endorsing the movie. Um, it was a uh, documentary, rockumentary, if you will, of this band Spinal Tap, you know, and it was, it was, it was a spoof on rock bands and and it had all the, you know, the normal situations where the lead singer's girlfriend you know, has conflict with Nigel, the electric guitar player. And so they're like, they're in these, they're playing these big stadiums, right? You know, like thousands and thousands of people. And, and then it just kind of shows as they get older, this decline of the, the rock band. And, you know, before you know it, you know, they're the, they're the opening act for the puppet show at the state fair, you know, and, and uh, you know, they're playing, you know, backyard, you know, kids' birthday parties. And I saw this church, when they stopped believing the authority of God's word, they had to change their mission statement. They had to change their doctrinal statements. And, and I saw it decline. It began to decline. They started losing campuses. They started having to let staff go. And we, we saw this thing unfold over several years. And, and they went from multiple campuses and 7,000 people down to one campus. And then they lost that campus. And then they had to let go of staff and, and more staff. And the next thing you know, they're, they're meeting in an elementary school in a, in a cafetorium with one service. And, and, then, and then they're not even meeting in person. Now, now they're meeting online. And their pastor now isn't even a Christian. He's a spiritual advisor living in California, taking people on outdoor trips. And it all began because they blurred the lines and they, they didn't know, they decided, okay, we're not going to live by the truth of God's word. We have to correctly handle the truth of God's word. Right. Yes, we love everyone, but we've got to speak the truth of his word. Continuing on with 2 Timothy chapter 2. It says, in a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for noble purposes and some for ignoble. If a man cleanses himself from the latter, he will be an instrument for noble purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared for any good work. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. A person God uses is a clean vessel. Now, there's different translations of the Bible, and this verse 21 uh, uses different illustrations. Uh, the NASB, I'll read that, it uses vessel. It says, therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, from the wicked things, from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, and prepared for every good work. So, so some translations use instruments, some translations use tool, and NASB uses vessel. I want us to use that vessel, a clean vessel. The word says that if we cleanse ourselves from sin so that God can and will use us. Now, we know that the Holy Spirit is who sanctifies. He's the one who sanctifies us. But, but we're in partnership with the Holy Spirit. Like, we're, we're working together. It's our job to get in the Word. It's our job to worship. It's our job to pray. And, and he says to flee the evil desires of youth. So, so we're to run away, from, we're to get as far away from sin, and we're to pursue righteousness, to pursue holiness. It says in 2 Corinthians 7, 1, Therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. So it is the role of the Holy Spirit to sanctify us, but he says we are to purify ourselves. We are to take steps towards holiness. We're not to let anything contaminate our souls. We're not to be contaminated by the world. And it says that we're to strive for perfection out of reverence for God. Reverence for God. A holy fear of God. 
I feel like so many Christians in America have lost their reverence for God. We've lost this holy fear of God. What, what's going to keep me from sinning? What's going to keep me from clicking something I shouldn't be clicking? What's going to keep me from looking at something I shouldn't be looking at? What, what is, what, what is going to keep me from doing something I shouldn't be doing? It should be a holy fear of God, a reverence for God. God is looking for clean vessels. He's looking to use pure and holy people. 2 Chronicles 69 says, For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose hearts are completely his. God is looking to use people whose hearts are fully his. He, we've surrendered our heart to him. We've surrendered our lives to him. Now, none of, none of us is perfect. I, I keep saying that. But I believe the cleaner we are, the more God can use us. Now, back when Jennifer and I got married, and we were getting married uh, like 30 years ago, it's been a long time, um, we registered for wedding gifts. I don't know if y'all, you know, back in the day, they had like wedding showers and people brought gifts to weddings. Are y'all familiar with what I'm talking about? They still, they still do that today. So we registered for things that some of the younger people probably don't even know what they are. Uh, we had like everyday china, but then we also had the fine china. Okay, we had, we had silverware, but then we had flatware, right? You had, you had your regular glasses, but then you had your stemware. So some of the young people don't know what we're talking about. Uh, my daughter, when she got married, she didn't register at these places. She registered, they registered at Home Depot and Dick's Sporting Goods, <laughs> which I'm thinking, why weren't we able to do that? You know, get like a new set of golf clubs for the wedding. So you end up getting all of these gifts. Oh, great, you know, a, a soup ladle or, or whatever. Um, so then also passed down to us was my grandmother's china cabinet. And in my grandmother's china cabinet, that's where you put the fine china and the stemware and, and the flatware, which only gets used, you know, once or twice a year on special occasions when everybody comes over for Thanksgiving or Christmas or, or something like that. So I'm out in the yard, I'm, I'm working in the yard, I'm hot and sweaty, I might go jogging, I might be playing basketball, and I come inside and I want something to drink. Never once in my life have I gone to my grandmother's china cabinet, opened up the china cabinet and gotten a nice crystal glass <laughs> and gone and filled it up with ice and water, right? The reason why I don't do that is because they're dirty. They're dusty. There's got, they're cobwebs. We don't even use them. They're just sitting, they, they're nice and expensive. Now, what do I do? I get the big gulp plastic cup that I got at the 7-Eleven, a 32-ouncer. Because it's clean. And, and, and God is looking for clean vessels. He's not looking for the Christian that, 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 that's all fancy and expensive looking and, you know, everything looks great on the outside. He's looking for those who are clean on the inside. God uses people who are clean vessels. God wants us to be a clean vessel, useful to the master and prepared for any good work. A person God uses is available. 2 Timothy 2, 21 says, if a man cleanses himself from the latter, if he cleanses himself from sin, he'll be an instrument for noble purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. God uses available tools. I know that a lot of you guys have tools. A lot of you guys have a lot more tools than I have. And some of you are real, real organized with your tools. You have storage buildings full of tools. You have basements full of tools. You have a garage full of tools. And you're very structured and you're very organized with your tools. You know, you have, you have your woodworking tools here and you have your power tools here and you have your lawn equipment over here. And some of you even have these really nice like, like uh, metal cabinets with drawers and you've got like your ratchet sets and your wrenches and your screwdrivers and you're very, you're very organized. Some of you even have coffee cans with screws and nuts and bolts that you've been saving for decades that you might use one day. <laughs> this is my dad. 
The young people don't even know what coffee cans are. But anyway, you know, he's got these calls. I mean, everything's organized, right? And when you have a job to do, you have a task, you know exactly where that tool is. And you go to that tool and you get that tool and you use it for whatever purpose that you need. And I have found over the years that in order to do a job, you have to have the right tools. But also you have to know where they are. Now, I don't have a lot of tools. I do have some tools. But my problem is I'm not very organized. And I don't know where my tools are. I have some tools in the garage. I have some tools in the basement. I have some tools. Jennifer and I have like have six or seven junk drawers <laughs> in the kitchen. Jennifer and I are not very organized. It's kind of a miracle that we've just made it through life. It's just like a miracle that we've, <laughs> we've made it this far. But let's just say I, I need a Phillips head screwdriver. Well, I know that I have dozens of Phillips head screwdrivers, but I don't know where they are. I, I can't find them. Like, I need the screwdriver, and I have all the different sizes. So you know what I end up doing? Go to Home Depot and buy another Phillips head screwdriver, and then I don't know where that one is. I have dozens of screwdrivers, but what good are they if they're not available when I'm ready to use them? And it's the same in our, our relationship with Christ. We need to be a tool. We need to be an instrument. We need to be ready and available to be used. Like we're sitting in the toolbox like a screwdriver, and, God, and we're just ready for God. We're waiting on him. Like say, God, use me. I'm available. Whatever comes up, whatever your Holy Spirit leads me to do this week, like I'm ready, I'm available, I want to be used by you. Are you prepared for every good work? Are you ready to be used by God? Are you available? You could have all the ability in the world, but if you don't have the availability, what good is it? You could have all the Bible knowledge in the world. You could have all the ministry skills in the world, the ministry training. You could be a five-talent person. I'm talking about the parable of the talents, Matthew 25. You could be a five-talent person. But if you're unavailable, what good is it? If you're not willing to serve, what good is it? You're wasting your God-given talents and abilities. And if you're not using your time and your talents and your treasures, then what good are they? If you're not using them for God's purposes, they have no eternal value. God cares more about our availability than about our ability. You could be the best, most talented football player on the team. You could be a five-star recruit. You could be the fastest dude on the team, best hands on the team, strongest person on the team. But if you never get in the game, if you never play one down, what good is it? What, what good is, is being blessed with all of that talent if you never get in the game? And it's the same in the kingdom of God. You can have all the talent and the ability in the world, but if you stay on the sidelines, it's as if your talents and your abilities do not exist. Speaking of football, go Tigers, by the way. We're, we're not good, but I'm going to say it when we win. So we got to interview on the Family Goals podcast, we interviewed uh, Dabo Sweeney. He's the head football coach uh, for Clemson. And Dabo used an incredible analogy of a flat football. And I want you to hear what Dabo had to say about it. I always tell uh, people it's like a flat football. If you had a flat football, it'd be hard for it to fulfill its purpose, right? It'd be hard for it to you know, throw it, kick it, and do all these things and fulfill the purpose it was created for. And it's the same thing with us as people. If we don't have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, you know, it, it, it's hard. We're just like that flat football walking around in life. It'd be hard for us to fulfill and know the purpose that we're created for. Why, wise words from Dabo Swinney. If we don't have the Holy Spirit, we're like, we're like a deflated football. We can't fulfill God's purpose and God's plan 
for our lives. So I want to I recap for you what we've talked about in this Ford series as we're studied through 2 Timothy. Uh, the first thing I share with you the first week is that God has called you to serve. God has called every single one of us to serve him. God wants you to serve him in ministry. Yes, I said that. God calls every single one of us to have a ministry. Now, some of us is by vocation, uh, vocational, uh, it's by vocational, it's part-time. Some of us is volunteers. But God has a unique purpose and plan for your life. There's something that he's called you to do that only you can do. And God has given you gifts and abilities and talents to do what it is he's called you to do. And then God has empowered you with the Holy Spirit. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit that we can do what it is that God has called us to do. And just as a football needs to be full of air to fulfill its purpose, a servant of God needs to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that leads me to the last point is a person God uses is filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, the word for spirit in Hebrew is ruah. Ruah. And it actually means wind or breath or spirit. And just as a football needs to be filled with air, we need to be filled with the breath of God, the wind of God, the spirit of God. God breathes his spirit into us and empowers us to fulfill his purpose and his plan for our lives. Acts 1.8 says, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. God has empowered us by the Holy Spirit to be witnesses for him. And God wants to use us to spread his good news and see lives change for all eternity. Now, I've had the privilege to do a lot, a lot of incredible things in life. But there's no greater joy in life than being used by God to see somebody else's life change for all eternity. Amen. To see someone, they weren't going to heaven, now they're going to heaven, and I got to play a small part of that. There's no greater joy in life than that. Now, I have shared share with you guys that we, we are focused on the next generation. We are putting a lot of time and energy and manpower into reaching the next generation for Christ. And this past weekend, last weekend, we had 200 students go on fall retreat. Yeah. All right? Now, in order for 200 students to go out of town and spend two nights away at a camp, we had to have 40 adults go. Now, these 40 adults, they sacrifice their weekend. I want you to think about them. Do they want to sleep at this camp? Do they want to eat camp food? Yes. <laughs> Do they want to stay up till all hours of the night? Do they want to deal with girls' middle school drama? Do they want to miss college football all day on Saturday? But, but let, me, let me tell you something. Last weekend, we had 19 students commit their lives to Jesus Christ. Right? 19. 19 middle school and high school kids whose lives are changed for all eternity. 19 students who are no longer going to hell, they're now going to heaven. And those 40 adults, every single one of them, got to play a part in seeing those lives change for all eternity. Some of our adults were on, on the stage singing. Some of our adults were small group leaders. Some of our adults were driving vans. Some of our adults were just chaperone, uh, chaperones and uh, security. Some were small group leaders. But every single one played a part in seeing those lives change for all eternity. God wants to use you. He wants to use your time and your talents and your treasures to see somebody else's life change for all eternity. Today, we are, we are celebrating baptisms across all of our campuses. I know these, these two are super pumped. These guys are on, these guys are so on fire for, for God, it makes me more on fire for God. But across all of our campuses, I wanna share with you guys, we have, we have like 20 something people getting baptized today. And if, if you, 
If you serve at Greystone Church, if you're a volunteer, and we have hundreds of volunteers, if you serve at Greystone, you're a part of every single life that's been changed for all eternity. Everybody that's getting baptized, you played a part in it. You, you might have been in the parking lot, parking cars, or you're standing at the door greeting people, or you're behind the scenes doing admin stuff, or you're, you're, back, you're, you're back holding babies while, while the adults are in here. You could be doing student ministry. We, we have so many people who serve. And if you serve, I want you to be encouraged. I want you to be inspired. Because when these people are crashing the waters of baptism, you got to play a part in that. You know, the success of Greystone Church is not built upon a celebrity pastor or a few rock star Christians. We are average, ordinary people. And God is using us to change people's lives for all eternity. And once you get involved in seeing somebody else's life change for all eternity, you're going to get hooked. You're going to be a part of it. The joy to serve Christ. I want to give you the opportunity today to be a part of our team. To be used by God to change somebody else's life for all eternity. So we're praying. Our staff team's been praying. Our elders have been praying. We're trusting God today for 129 new people to sign up to volunteer. 129. And you might be, be saying, well, Jonathan, that's a very specific number. Well, that's what the need is. <laughs> Across all of, all of the serving teams, everybody kind of, hey, this is what we need. So we have it divided up. It's on the, your, uh, your car that was in your seats. And it's divided up into... Uh, kids ministry, student ministry, first impressions, which is parking and greeting and coffee bar, uh, production up on stage, the behind the scenes stuff. There's all kind of opportunities here at Greystone. Now, a huge need that we have is children's ministry. And one of the reasons we have such a big need in our kids area is because our kids area since last year has doubled in size grown 100%, over 100%. And so when you have twice as many kids, you need twice as many volunteers. I mean, I've got men in my discipleship group who are jumping back and holding babies. And one of the guys informed me that he had a crying baby first service and he couldn't get the baby to quit crying. And they went into the nursing room and the baby heard me preaching and fell asleep <laughs> and was asleep the rest of the service. With my preaching, I said, well, that's very encouraging. Thank you so much. <laughs> I want to encourage you. Get off the sidelines. Get in the game. Use your God-given talents and abilities to serve Him. We are a team. You, you guys heard me share on the video before the, before the message. Jennifer and I love you guys. It's, it's an honor for us to be here. We're, just, we're happy to be on the team. I feel like we've got the best team in the world. And if you're not serving, I'm going to encourage you to serve. So if you would, do me a huge favor. Fill this out. You can serve one, one, once a month. Just get your toes wet. You can serve twice a month. I mean, if you want to do a big cannonball in the deep end, you can serve every week. So you can fill this out, whatever you're interested in. We'll have our staff uh, follow up with you. You can drop this in the offering bucket uh, when it comes around. So I want to give you two ways to respond today. One is to sign up to serve. And the other is I want to open up the altar for prayer. Because, because when I was sharing earlier, I know God always uses his word to, to pierce our hearts. And maybe God was piercing something in, in your life that you want to surrender to him. So we just want to open up the altar for prayer. And if you feel led during this next song, this response song to come and pray, then I want to encourage you to come and pray. All right, let, let me pray for us. We're going to continue in worship. God, we thank you for uh, your purpose and your plan. And I thank you, God, that that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, uh, 
to die on the cross for our sins, God, because none of us can make it to heaven on our own. We're all sinners in need of a Savior. We've all fallen short of, of your glory. And God, I pray if there's anyone here, anyone listening, anyone watching who has never put his or her faith into you, I pray they would do that today. And if that's you, just surrender your life to God. Give him your heart. Give him everything. Ask him to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you, to wash you as white as snow. And he'll come inside of you and he'll change your life. And he'll begin the sanctification process. God, we want to we be used by you. We want to we know that you, you're the one that gave us our talents and our abilities and uh, our time and our resources. We, we want to use it to fulfill your purpose and your plan. We want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We don't want to be like deflated footballs. We want to be empowered by you. And I pray you would use us, God. I pray that you would lead each person in our church to find his or her place where they can f be fulfilled, where they can use their talents and their abilities to serve you and to build the church and to expand the kingdom of God. Can we thank you for those who are getting baptized today and, and their family and friends that are here to support them. I pray that it would be a very special, very meaningful day uh, for them, a, a day that they'll never forget. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, church, we're going to move into a time of response. If you'll go ahead and stand, we're going to continue to worship.
excited. We're going to move into a time of baptism. What an awesome response to this message. And every time in, when someone gave their life to Christ and received forgiveness of sins, every time that happened in the Bible, the next step was baptism. And so that's what we're celebrating today. These candidates getting baptized, they have said, I I'm a Christian, I've surrendered my life to Christ and they're following in obedience. And so we're so excited about that. And I'm gonna give it to Barbara who's gonna baptize Tracy. Tracy was brought up Catholic and she uh, certainly knew God and Jesus, but that was about the end of it. And uh, Throughout her life, she tried different churches and then decided, hey, I think I can do this on my own. I don't need that. And thank goodness, a, a good friend of yours uh, invited her to a women's conference, and the Holy Spirit started to stir in her. And uh, then a good friend, Mary Darling, invited her to come to my small group, and the rest is history. And now she is ready to publicly uh, declare her her faith in God and that she wants to follow him forever. So I have two questions for you. Have you accept, accepted Jesus as your Savior? I have. And are you going to follow him all the days of your life? Yes, I will. I find it such an honor and privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Spencer right now bap baptizing some of our students uh, with the decisions that they made uh, this past weekend. This is my man, Keegan. Come on in, buddy. Keegan's one of our students who, uh, if you've met him, you love him. Uh, <laughs> and Keegan, he and, I, he and I got to have some cool conversations re uh, recently during fall retreat, after fall retreat. Um, he uh, he is an awesome individual, and and the conversations we got to have, he was actually he actually accepted Christ a few years ago at his previous church, but he he's never followed through in in believers' baptism, and so um, got to have some cool conversations. And he said, "Man, I'm I'm ready to take this next step and show show the world outwardly what what God's done inwardly." So, Keegan, I have a couple questions for you, buddy. Have you um, have you asked Jesus to be your Savior? I have. Amen. And do you promise to, uh, to live for him for all your days? I do. Amen, man. Well, upon your profession of faith, it's my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Absolutely incredible seeing these students because you don't know what now their kids and their grandkids' lives are changed forever. So we got more students still. Amen. And this this is our friend Lily, and um, she's one of our students. And you see her small group leaders up here, what Jonathan talked about. So they're going to do the talking. They're going to share the story here. So this is my um, this is my honor. Lily Friend has been in my group for a couple years, and what Jonathan said is true. Do you want to stay up all night? No. Do you want to eat camp food? No. Um, but I would stay up for a week straight to see this happen. So when I think of Lily, um, and I told her mom this earlier, Lily is the epitome of the fruits of the Spirit. Um, and we talk to our girls about that all the time, love, patience, peace, joy, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. And Lily truly is the epitome of all of these things. Um, and I love her, and it is an honor to be with her week in and week out. When I asked Lily what her favorite verse was, she said Isaiah 60, 22, which boils down to, at the right time, the Lord will make it happen. And I think that that is so profound for a young person to say, and that that just shows how she lives out the fruits of the Spirit. So Lily, I have two questions for you. 
Do you profess that Jesus is your Lord and Savior? I have. And do you promise to follow him for the rest of your days? Yes, I do. Awesome. Lily, upon your profession of faith, it's our honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. keep going here. Um, these guys right here, I am so excited about, so, so excited about. I know they got a, they got a whole fan club right here. We're excited. Here you go, guys. The, uh, my name is Andy Ring. I'm a pastor uh, down from South Georgia. And uh, as you can imagine, you don't get to spend a lot of time with family uh, if you pastor or preach or get to go uh, uh, called away. Uh, then that's what you're called to. Amen. Uh, but, uh, you know, amazing thing is, is nine months ago in December, I found out I got a nephew and I'm 51 years old. On the same day, I found out I got a brother, a nephew, a niece, a sister-in-law, so many things. And it's one of those just incredible things of God. Can't understand it and can't explain it, but God's timing is perfect. And you know, it's amazing. Uh, I was drawn. As soon as I found out I was drawn. I had to, I mean, it's like ran to them. As soon as I found out, I, I've drawn to them as a family to get to know them and know more about them. And, and ultimately, it began very quickly to hours every time that I talk with Davin. You know, it's a lot of things you can talk about in 51 years missing, right? But he want to talk about the Lord. He want to talk about his relationship with God and how far he'd been away, you know, and it's a beautiful thing to watch, one that was lost for a family, for my brother. I've never known that that prodigal son come home. How God will answer prayers and draw you. We get away a couple weekends, and man, it'd be hours. Jim, my son, they'd walk away because they knew there was some business that he wanted to talk about. And for some reason, he was drawn. Had a little part for your nephew is a sweet thing right for a family to have a little part for a church I can see why uh, God keep drawing and drawing and drawing to a point today that Davin comes before a congregation not ashamed of the gospel and as the pastor said man they are on fire it's fantastic I can't wait to see what's in store so it is my privilege as your uncle but more importantly as your brother in Christ got eternity to get to know more about you but to baptize you. So I'd ask you, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? I have. Do you commit to following him all your days? Yes, I do. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Davin, I baptize you, my brother. <laughs> oh, my God. We're going to keep this moving. We got his buddy coming. Oh, no, you, you go. <laughs> this is a, uh, this actually should be Davin in my mind. And it shouldn't be Davin because it ain't about me and it's not about Davin. About the uh, Holy Spirit of a holy God. Matt, I don't know if he's got ADD or if he's just on fire for the Lord, but let me tell you something. This young man is on fire. Amen. That's what we were talking about. He is, uh, look. I met, with him last, I met him last week the first time, and he's just talking about the joy of going down and sharing Christ in the middle of Athens, wherever. Uh, and, you know, it, talking about challenging somebody, right? Uh, but I fully believe with all my heart, I know it's, it's the Lord, but you want to know what having a burden for somebody and praying for somebody will do? It'll see it fulfilled. We went on a, one of our trips that Jim and Carter walked away talking about a burden, a friend that has a burden. And we sat there and prayed. I'd known Matt about six months. He's known me a week because of burden of prayer. 
And Davin just so earnestly in tears praying for somebody. Next thing you know what's going to happen, God's going to get in the middle of it. And he is on fire. Uh, I cannot wait to see what God's got in store for this young man. Uh, the uh, Continue. He that began a good work, he'll continue it. So it's my privilege to baptize you today. Have you accepted, Matt? Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Yes, I have. Do you commit to following all the days of your life? I do. Amen. Following the command of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen, amen, amen. Absolutely, absolutely incredible. So if your heart is racing, you got butterflies in your stomach, that's the Holy Spirit talking to you right now. So on our communication card, if you have more questions about baptism or if you're like, man, I need Jesus, let us know so then that way we can walk with you in the next coming days and weeks as you begin this new relationship with Jesus and really experience life and life to the fullest. And if this is your first time, I want to encourage you to uh, fill this out. We'll make a $5 donation in your honor to our local food bank so you can make a difference. But man, what an incredible Sunday of what God is doing. And you can be a part of that by the gifts and the abilities God has created you because you can do something that only you can do. And so right now is a perfect opportunity for you to, to get connected and start using those gifts and ability here at Greystone Church. Maybe you love to cook and you love to care for people, those that are in need. Join our care team because there's stuff happening every day of the week and you could use those talents and abilities to help people in those needs. So sign up for that. Or maybe you love to play an instrument or maybe you love photography, obviously production. Hello, that's my world. Man, come let us know. Or maybe you love to do stuff behind the scenes. Nobody knows, man, we want you and your family to be serving and connected. So be sure to sign that up on the back of our, um, our serving sheets. So then that way you can put it in the offering basket here in just a minute. So as we move into a time of offering, guys, this is something that we love to do at Greystone. There is zero pressure, but man, I'm telling you what, if you and your family are not tithing, you are missing out on experiencing Jesus working in ways that you've never seen before. So we have four ways to give, super easy. We have two kiosks out in the lobby. That's probably the easiest way to give. You can text, we can give online, you can mail a check. And so as we move into a time of giving, let's pray. God, we just thank you, God. Thank you for the work that you are doing here at Greystone, Jesus, God, and just seeing people come to a saving knowledge of who you are, God. And so we just pray for them, God, as they grow, as they grow in your relationship with them, God. We thank you for this time that we can give back, God, for what you have generously given us. And so just multiply it, God, as we dominate the community with the love of Jesus, God. And so we just thank you, God, your name that we pray. Amen. So as the offering buckets are being passed, guys, we have some amazing mission opportunities. And so at Greystone, missions are a huge part. So uh, we got a couple trips coming up. And so if you're interested, email alan at greystonechurch.com. He's our missions pastor because you don't want to miss out on these great opportunities to, again, serve those people that are in need. Use the gifts and ability God has given you to really impact and so if you have questions about that, let me know. Email alan at graystonechurch.com. So then that way, again, you can use what God has given you um, and take it to a whole new level. But guys, what an incredible Sunday. We are so thankful that you chose to be here this Sunday. You could have been anywhere else. And so guys, y'all have an amazing Sunday and y'all are dismissed. <laughs>